movement a whole century after the men's game had become the first team sport of the Summer Olympics. But Canada still had to qualify for Sydney, and only six teams would be part of the women's debut. Competition would be cutthroat. The Canadian women had just the man for the job. Dan Bertelet, a coach who had devoted his life to this sport long before it gained Olympic distinction, a driven man now with a new purpose. He has a really soft spot in my heart, and he always will. Trying to relax, Tanya, you're, you're, you're stiff, it's easy, there, take it, boom. Don't be so stiff, loosen up a bit. I know that he cares for each and every one of us. Wake up! And uh, sometimes he's really hard, harsh, but that's Dan, man. <laughs> you know, he's not uh, all frills and bows and, back, you know, he's rough around the edges. The team we, we are is very emotional and uh, we sometimes get in fights uh, within each other, kind of, you know, kind of word fights. And uh, so we, then sometimes there are people crying and stuff, and he's really, you know, he's not going to show his emotion, and he's really staying calm. Sometimes he's going to go uh, really angry, but it's more about the plays we do. To qualify for the Sydney Summer Games, Canada would have to defeat the USA in the FINA Cup. The Americans were their arch rivals, and in head-to-head -head competition, they were evenly matched. This game would be decided in Canadian waters in Winnipeg, and it was desperately close. The Americans all over the Canadians, just over four seconds to play now. There's nobody in the American goal. In the last minute, Canada had a one-goal lead, and the ball was in the hands of Captain Cora Campbell. Cora Campbell with the long shot, she scores! It's over. Uh, there was a lot of emotion, I think, down there because of all the years uh, you see all the sacrifice, and you say it was worth it. Hugs and kisses on the Canadian bench. It just proved that our hard work paid off. Canada is going to the Olympics. Winning the Phoenix Cup was the most amazing experience for me, the most amazing feeling, I guess, for me. I mean, I've watched that tape, the end of the tape, I don't know how many times at least 50 times, and still it brings me to tears when I watch, watch the last quarter and everything. And I know what's going to happen, you know? It was like I was floating. It was like I didn't believe it. I had never felt something like that before. And I remember seeing, you know, like, carry a dream around with you for so long. It's like a crutch, but it's a comfort. And you, you lie at bed at night and you dream about it. And it's always a dream. It's something you can think about. And when you achieve it, it's like, you don't know what to do. It's like, how many people get that opportunity? And uh, and I and I remember like, it's like it's like it's it's so in there, and now it's brought to the surface. It's being realized. But then I guess you fill that spot again with another dream. But at the time, it was so so fresh, so it was pretty emotional. <laughs> Later that summer, the Canadians, still buoyant from their Olympic birth, were back in Winnipeg. Women's water polo was making its first appearance at the Pan Am Games. The Canadians went unbeaten and celebrated another win over the Americans to take the gold medal. Still, there was something missing. Water polo is a rugged game, and the scouting report on the Canadians said they could be intimidated. And then came a tour in Italy against the former world champions. The game got violent. The Italians threw punches. They kicked and scratched. They broke Cora Campbell's nose. But the Canadian women fought back, and it was a defining moment. That just show how they uh, care for one another. They're very proud of one another, and also they learn together to be a big family and to care for one another. I think that's what's very important when you play a team sport. If you don't have those components for a team sport, you cannot succeed. So that's very important that when somebody gets hurt, everybody rallies and show the other team, you can't do that. It's as simple as that. He was proud of us. He was proud that we stood up for each other and that, uh, and then we said, look, you, you can't do this to us. You can't, you can't throw punches and get away with it. So he was, he was proud that we did what we did. I think what Dan, I guess what he's focusing on is the fact that 
we used to always complain, oh, they touched me, they elbowed me, they did this and that, and he gets so sick of it. He's like, why don't you do something about it? And um, we did something about it, and, and now they're less likely to, you know, throw a punch at us if they know that they're going to get it like back like 12 times. You know, <laughs> Sometimes at this level, you get, if you get pushed around, you're not going to go anywhere. So you can't really get pushed around. So that's, that's what happened over there. They tried to intimidate us. And uh, we responded very good, and we responded as a team. Sometimes it happens in the past that somebody got hit and she was kind of left alone. But this time, we really stuck, stood up for everybody, and that was great. It was a great feeling saying, hey, we really belong together. We're a team, and we're going somewhere with that. But an even bigger test loomed ahead. The Australians, Olympic gold medal contenders, were coming to Montreal for the Canada Cup. Before the year was out, the Canadian team would know where it stood on the road to Sydney. One moment, please. For this groundbreaking Canadian women's water polo team, it's been two and a half years of hard work, poor pay, and positive results. Life as an Olympic athlete is not as glamorous as it might seem. Bagels are the order of the day when you live on $685 a month. Thank you. Until the federal government gave them a raise this year, they've existed on tight budgets, trained with a blue-collar work ethic, and received little or no attention in an effort to be among the first women to play water polo in the Olympics. I'm pretty good at budgeting, so I, I seem to have squeaked things in, you know. but. I mean, I look at it, I'm going to be finished the Olympics at 26, like the next one's at 30s, and I probably won't have a house, I don't have a car, you know, I, I do what I, I can on the money that I get, you know, I, I save my money, I ride my bike. It is tough being an athlete because you don't have financial freedom, if you want to say, but, uh, but I think that if you, if you budget well, you, you can do it. The Claude Robillard Centre in Montreal home of men's water polo at the 76 Olympics. But in December of last year, the women moved front and center for an important Olympic showdown of their own, the Canada Cup. The home team in blue caps faced Australia, the host team in Sydney, and a serious threat for Olympic gold. If they could beat the Aussies, anything was possible. In the final minute, the score was tied at five. Then, with just three-tenths of a second left to play, Joanne Bejan scores the winning goal. Amid the euphoria that grips this Montreal pool is the realization an Olympic medal is a very real prospect. Winning was infectious. Yet, as they savored this moment, they all knew the biggest test was yet to come in Sydney. Every team will be tough, every game difficult. When we'll be going down to the Olympic, it'll be a battle. Every day is going to be a battle, a one goal different, two goals different. And you can't bet really honestly who's going to win that gold medal. It's going to be a day-to-day -day struggle thing that you come, either you win the game and you lose, and now you're going to bounce back to be capable of going to the final and going to cross over. It is scary. You know, we're embarking on sort of kind of like a Dan likes to put the battle. You know, you're heading in with your bazooka or whatever he calls it, you know. Um, you have to be armed and ready and dangerous, you know, and that's what we are. Since we've qualified, we, we've realized that we, we, really, uh, we really belong together and that we can accomplish something together. What are the things that we have to focus on? Okay, on the defense part. What are the games I have to It's so is in, in our grasp. Okay. It's in our dream. It's in our grasp. You know, I think that... Uh, my team is um, a very, very, very unique and uh, special group of people. And I think that uh, we have all the ability in the world to do that, and I believe that we're going to do it. I have full belief in my teammates and, and trust in them that they feel the same way towards me. And I think that as a group, it's going to take all of us. It won't be one or two of us. It'll take every single one of us. This is a team united but a team still driven by individual goals and dreams. I mean, I'm so proud to just represent Canada. I remember 
in 92 when I got my first Canada jacket. I used to wear it everywhere. Wherever I went, I, I wore my jacket. I would go, I don't know, out to eat, I'd wear my jacket. I'd, I'd just go for a walk down the street, I'd wear my jacket, you know? So uh, I'm just so proud to represent the country, and especially at the Olympics, it's just going to be awesome. I'm really selfish on that. <laughs> yeah, it was for me. I've played since I was nine or ten, and uh, that was my dream, and now I am doing it for me. I play, I play water polo because I love it. I love water polo, and I love, um, I, 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 I just love playing, and it's a place where politics and sport don't mix. I'm in this field because it is a place that I can be unique, you know, and uh, I am a Mohawk. That's me. I was born that way. Um, I play water polo, from, number one, for myself. I play for my family, and I play for anybody who ever gave a damn about water polo. And it doesn't matter who they are. And, uh, and I'm getting to realize an Olympic dream. I play for my teammates. They play for me. And that's simple, and there's nothing really complicated about it. The reality is that politics and sports have long been unruly partners in Olympic history. But these women won't allow it to upset the mix. I think playing for the game is the only way to play. I don't think that politics or, or money or anything should be brought into the thing. If you don't like the game anymore or love the game or are passionate about the game, you should not be playing and you should not be on the team. And I think that representing Canada and things like that uh, just come along with it. But that's really not why I play. That's it. Okay, two minutes rest, everybody. To play at this level and to have confidence at this level, you have to be an individual, yet you have to be able to work as a team. And I think that we, first and foremost, look at each other for what kind of water polo player you are. That's, doesn't matter if you're purple, doesn't matter. You are a great water polo player, and I want to play water polo with you. You know, Cora, awesome water polo player. Doesn't matter if she's green, doesn't matter. I still think she's a phenomenal athlete. And that's why I'm very honored to play with her. Mary Claude, Joanne Beijing, uh, Jose Marcelet, you know, like all these great athletes, it doesn't matter where they're from. And I think we, we realize that there's a bigger picture up there. We, we have to work together to be able to achieve our dream, and we know that. In the end, their stories are all different. They're incentive, distinct, and someday they'll all go their separate ways. But right now, these women have plotted a course for Sydney with a common goal. And whether or not they win an Olympic medal, they will have known the ties that bind a team, if not a country.